We're live. Well, welcome everyone. Bienvenidos, bonjour. Glad to have you with us here for our 38th week of Cultivating Voices live poetry from wherever you're joining us in the world. Well, we are here today for our 38th consecutive week of live poetry and our final new books showcase of 2020, featuring poets whose books have come out during the pandemic. I'm your host, Sandy Yanone. I'm the author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry that came out in 2019, although it might have, it was on deck for 2020 as well. Um, I wanna thank you for joining us today live from our Zoom poetry studio where we have some audience members, as well as those of you who are watching us live on Facebook. It has been a true, true joy to work behind the scenes to arrange the reading of the three poets that you'll be hearing from today. Um, uh, and before I introduce them, I want to share a little bit about Cultivating Voices. Cultivating Voices live poetry began at the end of March in response to the shutdowns and has developed into an international, intersectional, intergenerational reading series and poetry community with over 2000 members worldwide. We alternate weekly readings um, between a live open mic where we invite eight readers for 10 minute sets. Signups are always on the Thursdays before our reading. And what you're seeing today, our new book showcase that we started in July, where we have three or four readers, 15 minute sets. It's by invitation, but members can request a reading. And um, that is how we had this lovely configuration happen today. One of our members, Dana Patterson, did the thing, she emailed me. And that got us started in this wonderful chain of events to have these three fabulous poets that you're going to be hearing from shortly. We also occasionally have special events. So please double check our monthly schedule at the end of each week's event page. We're booked through June, 2021 for our new book showcases. Um, and I'll begin scheduling poets for um, in February for July through December of 2021. Please contact me just like Dana did through my email or PM me uh, on Facebook. If you'd like to be scheduled, uh, you need to be a current member of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry and your book needs to just have come out within um, a year of the reading. A reminder that next week is our last week of poetry for this extraordinary unprecedented year of 2020. A year we're very hard pressed to fit because of the pandemic but also I think because of the way it has amplified poetry. Uh, I've, I, I've, I was reflecting on the fact that I don't, the last time I recall being able to truly immerse myself in poetry was some of those years when I was in graduate school where I would just go to a poetry reading every single night when I lived in Boston. And um, I've never had such a, 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 a fertile year of poetry and I know that's not true of all writers. That's not how everyone's experienced the pandemic. But in terms of the ability to bring poets together in communities and configurations that we could never have imagined before Zoom, I think that's been one of the gifts of 2020. Well, I hope so. I hope you'll join us next week for a few special guest poets who will be joining us for some poetry, song, and cheer to kind of ring out. 2020 and have a little bit of cheer around hearing some original poems or poems that speak to this, the season, this season of light that we're in. We'll have a sign up on Thursday, but this will function like a true holiday open house. Just show up, read a poem, and maybe I'll drink a little nog. Well, on that note, let's switch to today's poets. The reason that we're really here. 
I'll introduce um, each one of them in the order that they'll be reading, and, and then I'll return uh, with some final wrap-up comments for today. Well, our first poet, as I said, Dana Patterson, is the person that got the ball rolling on this reading. I'm so glad uh, she reached out to me from, uh, from, from where she's situated, uh, normally a few, only a few, a few hours north from where I live, but, uh, but today we're coast to coast. Uh, I was so glad when she contacted me uh, just to, to say, hey, my book's out, can we do a reading? And, she, and that prompted us uh, having uh, uh, the three wonderful readers that we have today. Well, Dana Patterson is the author of Titania in Yellow from Pork Belly Press 2019. And if Mother Braids a Waterfall from Signature Books 2020. Her creative work has appeared recently in Anyi, The Maynard, and Tahoma Literary Review. She is the founding editor-in-chief of Psaltery and Lyre and a co-editor of Dove Song, Heavenly Mother in Mormon Poetry. She was a co-winner of the 2019 hashtag Dignity Not Detention Poetry Prize judged by Ilya Kaminsky. And of course, you can visit her at her website, which I'll put in the chat. Would you please join me welcoming Dana Patterson. Thank you so much, Sandy, for that generous welcome. And uh, thank you, Dawn, for being a technical support for us today. Thank you for hosting us. I'm so excited to be reading with Jamie again. We read together, was it in June, Jamie, or July? July, yes, um, and it was such a wonderful experience. I, I feel like Jamie is such a deeply generous and lovely human being, and I'm just excited to be reading with her again. And uh, I'm excited to hear Paige's work. This is just a huge thrill. So thank you, thank you. And thank you audience for being here for poetry. It's lovely. Um, I am going to read a few poems from my book, If Mother Braids a Waterfall, uh, which came out at the end of February, and I, of course, like many 2020 uh, book babies, you know, all of the events got canceled in this horrific domino effect. So I'm, I'm just really grateful for virtual readings like this one that Sandy and Don have put together and, and cultivated this wonderful virtual literary community. I'm really grateful. Um, a couple of caveats I like to offer about this book before I read from it. it. It is a book about my ancestors' conversion to Mormonism, as well as my deconversion from Mormonism and kind of wrestling with that ancestral legacy. Um, I, I want to affirm that I believe everybody's spiritual journey is very unique and very personal. And even though at times I'm critical of Mormonism in this book, um, I, I want to say that it's not a book that is supposed to convince anybody to leave Mormonism or to stay. Again, spiritual journey, deeply personal, deeply sacred, and I wouldn't want to in interfere with that at all. This is just, this is my journey. Um, it also is, it comes across as a critical in, in places of polygamy. And I want to say also that I, I am in favor of all kinds of loving formulations that are consensual and mutual. Where I have a problem with polygamy is when it, there is emotional or ecclesiastical abuse that is involved. So I like to offer those two caveats and clarifications before, before I read. So the first, the first piece I'm going to share with you is the first piece. It's called, The Mormons Are Coming. Mormons bring a handmade wreath of white mesh, silver ribbon, tinsel sprigs, a cheese and potato casserole, an offering of white lilies. Mormons bring a package of diapers, a green onesie, a purple turtle quilt. They bring a musical mobile that dangles Eeyore, Piglet, Tigger, and Pooh. They surprise you with a two-foot Christmas tree, white lights, 
red balls, and a golden star. They bring cranberry orange walnut bread, gingerbread, cinnamon rolls. They say, I'm sorry for your loss. They say congratulations. They say Merry Christmas. The Mormons are coming. They drink eggnog without rum. They drink Ovaltine and Postum. They drink Mountain Dew and Diet Coke in 32 ounce mugs. Energy drinks, yes. Coffee and tea, no. Alcohol, never. Mormons rake your leaves, weed your weeds, babysit your kid while you go to the hospital to have another kid. Mormons build monuments of prairie families and covered wagons and handcarts. They hold the weight of family trees and martyrdom and pioneer blood in their cupped palms. They say, my ancestors knew Joseph Smith, donated their china for crushing to make the temple's stucco sparkle, buried their massacred dead at Hans Mill. My husband says, my ancestor was Brigham Young's shoemaker, and there were a lot of little feet to shod. I say, my ancestor went to prison for polygamy. Three wives, 19 sons, nine daughters, 107 grandchildren. Mormons bless their new babies in white, baptize their children in white coveralls and pinafores, white at their weddings, white in their temples, white when they're laid out in their coffins, an apron of green around their waists. They wear white undergarments woven with folkloric magic, bullets repelled, burns deflected. Mormons dot hills with electric spires, Nauvoo Temple, Salt Lake Temple, a temple in your neighborhood, brazenly bright. The Mormons are coming. They come in the middle of the night when you have a blinding migraine. They come with consecrated olive oil and warm hands and baritone prayers. They come in the morning and sweep up the crying baby. They come in the afternoon and feed your cats, your turtles, your birds. Mormons bring a space blanket, a flashlight with extra batteries, a portable radio, a case of granola bars, a bucket of wheat, a crate of water. The Mormons are coming by car, by bicycle, on foot. They knock on your door. They wear black name tags and glowing faces and shiny hope. I wore a name tag, Sir Kid, Église de Jésus-Christ des Saints des Derniers Jours, French in my mouth, a mangled nasturtium. They say, welcome to the neighborhood. They say, it's nice to meet you. They say, see you Sunday. Mormon men wear white shirts, dark suits and power ties. They are clean cut, well shaven. Mormon women wear dresses or skirts in peach, spring green, lilac. Few rebels wear slacks. Mormons say, follow the prophet. They say fathers preside. They say men have priesthood, women have motherhood. Mormons gather for Sabbath in low church chapels. They shush their gigawatt kids and, plas and pass silver plates of torn wonder bread, trays of water in thimble sized paper cups. My daughters ask, why do only boys pass the sacrament? 
Mormons build a grand conference center with a waterfall welcome mat, a garden roof of native grasses and trees. They build it big enough to park two planes inside to gather Mormon masses from around the world. <laughs> they arrange a room with plinths, with the bronze busts of their prophets. My, my daughters ask, why are all the statues of men? Mormons issue proclamations, a proclamation to wash away polygamy, a proclamation to define the family, marriage between man and woman only. They say families are forever and paint the words in cursive above their doors like a threshold blessing, a paschal lamb's blood. The Mormons are coming. Mormons put up Prop 8 signs. They make calls, they go door to door. They have practice going door to door. They say, hate the sin, but not the sinner. They say, it's a choice. They say, gay is okay. Just stay celibate. And when a daughter, son, aunt, uncle, cousin, best friend, or fill in the blank, comes out. My mother tells me I'm bisexual. I agonize for half a decade's doubt before deciding to leave. Mormons send priesthood holders. Mormons send sister teachers. Mormons send missionaries. And when I ask them to stop, they send a card every month, a card with no return address. The cards say, it's spring now, summer's here, autumn's coming. So you can see it's, it's, a, it's a love letter to Mormonism, this book, and it's also a breaking up, a Dear John kind of letter. And hopefully you get my love and tenderness for this faith I was raised in, but also a clear reason why I personally needed to, um, to separate from that. Um, I was fortunate that my, my husband and I decided to leave at the same time. Our, the trajectory of our spiritual journeys were similar. And so I wanted to share with you, um, I have two more pieces to read. This is a love poem to my husband, it's a straight up love poem. I don't have too many of them. They're hard to write. <laughs> but um, <coughs> I was listening to Pedrag Otuma's beautiful podcast the other day, um, Poetry Unbound, where he was talking about how poetry invites us to make the private public. And sometimes that involves making our deep loves public. And I just feel right now at the end of this difficult year and in this holiday season, I want to share this deep love with you. So this is 33 reasons why, a partial list. Because the glazed strawberries at the restaurant are red hearts waiting. Because an hour later, beneath a brazen angel's gaze, we immortals sit on Temple Hill to survey a valley of promise because on the sticky vinyl of the back seat, your electric pinky skims mine. Tongues you teach me are soft and warm, nights dizzy with stars. When I serve you an accidental hairball on your spaghetti, you don't run for the door. When I serve you a volleyball, you know how to pepper bump, set, hit. And when we kneel at the altar, you play an allegro beat on the drum of my heart. Because our first night together, two icebergs 
learn to melt. And when we move far from the warmth of family, you are a furnace against loneliness. Because your legs look chiseled in slick blue running shorts, Michelangelo out for a jog, possibly is the pout of your face when you read, the pucker of your brows when I spend too much, the slack of your jaw when I show you the little white stick, the parallel pink lines. Because you pull over and don't look away when my stomach rebels by the gas station, by the river, in the tall grass near the church parking lot, it's our daughter's gins and your dark brown turning to cinnamon in their eyes. It's Sunday afternoon when you, the new Piper of Hamlin, sway them with your music. It has something to do with the way your resting hand makes a T in sign language. It has everything to do with your whispered mi amor and my answer mon amour because the lure of the universe pulls you out on a cool night in March to witness the geometry of the moon holding hands with two planets and quietly singing. Because you are a mountain boy with rivers in your veins and you turn over river rocks to show our girls the mayflies and press their eyes to binoculars to see a glacier's blue ice. Because you revive fish after the catch, deliver them to the wet grace of second life. Sometimes you come home early smelling like Old Spice and massage the place where wings grow. It has a little to do with the sounds you make when you sleep and the way your knees make a tent of our sheets, as familiar now as a ticking clock, as the taste of salt. It has a little to do with the oxytocin your sleeping form settles on me like a humidifier's mist. And when the cat of my sadness leaps onto your lap casually during dinner, you let it sit there feeling the bones of its shoulder blades with your thumbs. And on Sunday nights, our scriptures are heavy tomes of Shakespeare, pillowed by our thighs, our open palms. It's the brown and red and silver in your beard. It's the cello of your voice the vibration of your chest against the audience of my ear. It's slow sex at midnight in soft, half asleep dreaminess. Because I hate to share and because you don't believe in polygamy. Because both of us are part rose, part thorn and because breath is better from your mouth still warm. My last poem is, um, <laughs> I love it. I love it, Sandy. What is that? <laughs> and that's your heart icon. <laughs> I love it. Um, my last piece is, I could never be a Jehovah's Witness. I mean no offense to J-dubs, but I like celebrations too much to give them up. I love the smell of the pumpkin I gut with my girls, the plink of the seeds in the bowl of viscera, Jack's crooked grin lit by a candle. I love the pause in the rush of life for a day of grace, the long table laden and the bowl of olives I place by my plate. They are Russian fur caps on my fingertips. 
I love the lace doilies and pizzas shaped as hearts, the chalky taste of our conversation. Holidays, I sprinkle the tabletop with flour and guide the cookie cutters to the edges. Circles would not be the same. I would miss birthdays, ache to whip up the cakes my kids pick out, like strawberry with blue frosting and candy pearls. Those pearls I won't give up, not even for God. And anyway, my made to order deities would be the smiling kind, the rolling laughter, the squeal and clap after candles blow themselves out, cheering for our little light. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dana. I don't know if you can hear it, but it's actually a chiming heart. It's hard to get the chime to go. I don't know. It, it rings a little bit. Yeah, that's I can my, hear it. I yeah, can hear the little ringing. That's yeah. lovely. <laughs> it's kind of got that mandala feel to it. And uh, I just picked it up in the health food shop here in Old Saybrook. So it's a little bit of its debut. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for, you know, what a deeply personal book that, of course, when we go to that deeply personal place, we find universality and, and ways to connect uh, through each of our, our individual paths and journeys through humanity. And uh, so I, 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 I so felt that operating in the poems that you shared from your new collection. And that I want to, I want to remind folks if mother braids a waterfall. Thank you so very, very much. And congratulations on persevering through 2020 with the release of the release of the book. Uh, I like to share with folks always that um, it was a toss up whether my book was coming out in 2019 or 2020. And that is, um, and, and knowing that was a big impetus for me to start the new book showcase because I really wanted to support poets who's Who's, who, I, who I watched their launches evaporate and um, particularly in those early, early months um, as all of our readings did. But so it was really important and that's why we created the new book showcase. And thank you for sharing your new book, If Mother Braids a Waterfall. I'm never gonna think about icebergs the same way again. And I, I think about icebergs a lot, if you know anything about me. I'm a bit of a titaniac. <laughs> Thank you again. Well, in our beautiful chain of poets today, this beautiful necklace of poetry, we have Jamie McCarty, who was invited by Dana. <laughs> Jamie McCarty is the author of the new collection, The Minuses, a Mountain West poetry series title from February 2020, published by the Center for Literary Publishing at Colorado State University. She is also the author of three chapbooks of poetry, including Mind of Spring. The Minuses, her newest collection, is winner of the 2020 New Mexico Arizona Book Award for Poetry Arizona. And Mind of Spring was a winner of the 2017 Vellum, Vellum Chapbook Award. She teaches writing at Simon Fraser University 
As co-founder and editor of the online poetry journal, The Maynard, she is an active agent of promoting the work of other poets and artists passionately. Would you please join me in welcoming Jamie McCarthy. Okay, my dears. Um, wow, Sandy, thank you for that lovely flourish. You have me all uh, a blush here. How is the sound, my dears? Is it uh, coming to you good? Two thumbs up. Okay, great. Uh, Dana, wow, wow, wow. I have um, still the chills and goosies, you know, um, from those poems. I, uh, I love hearing them again. You're right, we, we read together in July and I got to hear them then. And then in the interim, I read the book and wrote a bit about it for the Maynard. And then that got sandwiched by hearing you again. And I, I um, so the poems have, a, uh, have taken on a, um, you know, a depth, I, I think, and a substance for me because in the ears and then silently to myself and then in the ears through your voice again. So wonderful, my darling, thank you so much. And Paige, I just can't wait to hear poems from Vortex Street. Um, I've, same thing, I've heard you. And then I read um, the book and wrote something for it for the Maynard um, and then now get to hear it again. And so I'm looking for, forward to that sandwich too, if I can put it that way. Uh, well, Sandy, once again, thank you so much for um, having me, having us, and Don for being in the background there, um, supporting us technically. It's really lovely to be with you, and uh, you're amazing, an amazing force of poetry community, um, and I, I really, I'm, I'm honored to be with you. Thank you so much for um, having me, inviting me. Um, thank you to Dana for making that happen too. And um, just for all of this that you've done for those of us who have been um, slightly bereft at bringing out poems, <laughs> poetry books in uh, this year of the pandemic. Um, I want to, um, I'm really, again, grateful to be sharing um, this time with all of you. I want to particularly welcome Eleni um, Zisamatos, who's here from um, Quebec, Canada. And uh, Eleni is the um, publisher, editor-in-chief at Vallum uh, magazine. And she, of course, is instrumental in um, bringing to the world mind of spring the chapbook that won the Vallum chapbook award and two of the poems from the minuses um, and one of which I, I think um, wants to be read today. We'll see when I get there. Um, we're also published in, in Vallum. So Eleni, bless you. I'm really happy to be here with you. And then also um, the one, the only Lisa Gett, um, whose deep conversation with me and with the poems of the minuses were, um, was completely indispensable to me uh, and continues to be. So Lisa, I'm so glad to be here with you. Okay, my dears, to the minuses. Um, let me orient you ever so slightly to these poems. Um, the title might cue you uh, to what's happening here. There are uh, many kinds of minuses that are taking place in these poems, um, particularly um, endangerments, I'll, as I'll call them, to the fragile ecologies of Earth, and um, particularly the uh, segment of the Earth where I am, the region of the Earth where I am, which is the American Southwest, um, and uh, the very amazing, most uh, magically diverse bioregion of the Sonoran Desert. Now, sometimes I, I live um, in Vancouver, BC, but I just migrated south with the birds here. So I'm in the desert and uh, reading to you from there, from these poems. 
And then the other thing I want to say about endangerments is that um, many of the poems address the kinds of endangerments that humans um, uh, deal with in their lives, um, the kinds of exiles and um, maybe suicides and um, other kinds of injustices and infractions, and in particular to women. So that's a bit what you're in for. The women's um, lives deal in many cases, yes, with the kinds of um, injuries that take place, but also the struggle and faith that's necessary to survive. Okay, here we go. Thin attachment. At this hour, any God is rain. A woman pulls plastic from a dumpster, holds it up to her body to see if it fits. She inhabits blatantly her wish to be dry. The rain inhabits its falling. My car inhabits the street. The wind winds the woman wrangling the plastic. A gull of newsprint scuds the fogged windscreen, veers me to a halt. My steering wheel, hands at two and ten, her shopping cart filled with clothes and wet cardboard. Morning's thin attachments. On the street of beggars, a monsoon wealth. So the, the poems deal with people moving through desert and urban, so um, desert and urban landscapes and particularly encounters um, of, uh, between, between women through the branches. And this poem has a Latin phrase, salvitor ambulando, and it um, translates roughly to it is solved by walking through the branches. Oranges as your kiss opens my mouth, forgetting where we are in a park full of mockingbirds. When my eyes open, I promise to tell the truth. The truth changes. A vulture eclipses. I become the sun a hanging swarm, seeing everywhere at once, everything. I cancel us to cross the desert, salvitor ambulando. Scent of sun on your forearm reverts to memory. The casita's roof absorbed into the mountain's forged shadow. From this angle, the sky parts mesquite branches. There's an occurrence bright enough to notice. Many of the women, the people in the, in the moving through the desert, through these landscapes are seekers. Mountain hypotenuse. My airstrip counters his, an absence within the desert where a kingdom of thorns is being intimate with my skin. One with his distance reified in shrine, lush barrenness of desert, I am the hour and destruction. My palms accordingly, Crawl mountain hypotenuse. Like a mountain, I fold and deform by lateral compression while simultaneously crumbling. I, as desert for the monsoon, occupy a vertical desire. Logic of opposites. Palo Verde's blossoms, tiny 
brassy trumpets play to the ground, jaundiced chords. Under fraction of crooking stamens, remnant sea, limestone strata. Asphalt accelerates the day shift toward rainbows, double blues. Logical sky, curve build thrasher, airplane, sun glinting an underscore. Fear rabbit approaches butterfly chair. The mechanical infuses the natural. More Latin, natura nihil frustra facet. Nothing in vain in nature. Helping nature is harming. We admire a beach found dolphin skull, but not tuna hunting. The daisy asserting upward in the crack of paving slabs, prehistoric cliff dwellings, but not looting, weddings, but not funerals. One without the other unfeasible as pianos flats without sharps. Isolation is invention. Any ruin song taken far enough includes its contraries. Genius may be the willingness to compromise. Otherwise, no room for us to put out our, to put our feet on the floor each morning, to make our music, to live. Okay, so um, this one is uh, for Ilani. It uh, was published in Vallum. Nor'easter, so go to the northeast for a bit out of the desert. The house on Atlantic Ave teeters on the embankment's edge. A feather could send it crashing. The black blue sea, there's no stopping, kicks in the door, strangles shore. House's floor, waters crashing and chasing feet. Walls, sand and froth, salt, an erosive coating. Wind, a burglar rustling shutters, whistles a tune about his weapon. Airborne gravel, a gravel of fists. Underneath that abusive sky, externalized and homeless. an equation indivisible. While your body slouches off key at wall and floor's precise angle, the great whales migrate to winter calving lagoons. The gunshot ricochets into your retreating. Time makes a mockery at the point of entry. Elsewhere on the planet, a mother calls her child a mistake. The word, a bullet. From what height you hurtled the split rail, returning the volley in our backyard game? From what depth the whale's surface puncture a new hemisphere? Gray embryos curled in the mother's wombs an equation, indivisible by both man and beast. Fate's integer, incalculable, from wind and waves, white noise. The person pulling the trigger never hears the sound. Related sequence. Pigeons perforate the ground. Dust won't hold together by itself. Wind bangs its head against the door. Trees don't know anything. The telephone, an abortion. Sorry, ossified by sorry in the garden. Late at night, cutting roses, 
At the end of the road, the sound the sea plays ceaselessly. Exodus of Canada geese, a long dark ribbon, loosening September sky. The day feels its own weight and buckles. In a window, a lace dress hangs itself. Epilogue. While she waits in a room of his knowns and unknowns, thinking about the threat of death, her jaw in ruin. Not everything's worth saving nor repair. He says she's logic in the right argument, lobbying in the right era. Her motivation hunts the Atlantic shore where the hostaged horses of Salisbury's carousel break free. Pretense stops. Okay, so after this string of, of deaths and, and suicides, there's a dream. Given distance from a given point. I cross the third degree of a great circle. The full moon gathers wet footsteps from stones. At night, gravity defines silences between oceanic miles. By the time waves replace themselves or the cockle shells split scars my palms exactly like wings, the stars seated in the dark pass our lives across the table. I dreamed him invisible in a thousand places. Night played remorse. I witnessed a woman being torn from her bicycle. But that woman, that woman, no longer blackbirds. And then um, perhaps in a kind of reversal, there's after much sorrow in the book, there's some anger, necessary, righteous kind of anger, extremity. What kind of a kit bag of solemn promise was that? What should have been a house is a housebreaker. There, a trial, a triad, a trespasser to whom an illusory figment attached itself. There, a trellis to which a fiend vined himself. There, a tremor, a trench, a trend to which a trendsetter flaunted himself. And there, a fight to which a fighter trained herself. There, a desert of leafless trees into which the rat exited its midden, punctual as an owl at dusk. Endangered species. Haze of pink light, desert, microburst, pearl hail pelts, human bodies and industrial machinery contiguous with meteorologists, heat liberating weather. Our bodies pocked by what surrounds them. A snippet gains no more depth. In this mecca of eroticism, a tiger skeleton marinates in an aquarium the dark tonic said to supply tiger stamina. For thematic coherence, follow the grail of wine bones. The liquor affects desire, not ability. With undainty haste, always yes and no. The illicit thing, partial. To pull certain themes together, the new century's new couple enters late, 
Zinfandel on their cheeks, accretion of context, but not meaning. The division flimsy connected to other such moments implicated in the world's disgraces. Denumo at the serial killing of rhinoceros and seahorses, owed to the demand for aphrodisiacs and medicine no stronger than aspirin. Lifestyles keep the demand infinite. From the grid of structure, the last gesture toward the body, a burning fragment in the menagerie of the surviving world. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, wow, Jamie. There is a reason that I come to listen to poetry week after week. There is a reason. I love nothing more than to hear the poet alight those poems off the page. And I feel like that is what you have done in your new book showcase reading from your book, The Minuses. Wow. Thank you so very much. I cannot wait Okay, I must have hit my mute button. I was saying I cannot wait until I have the, the pleasure of having the echo of your voice in my head as I read those poems again from your book, The Minuses, a 2020 New Mexico, Arizona book award winner. And we are very, very happy, of course, to have your publisher with us today in the audience and very, very happy to be able to uh, share the work that that partnership between editor, poet, you know, editor and publisher with the poet uh, from Mountain, the Mountain West Poetry Series. Thank you again. So great to have you as a member of Cultivating Voices. I mean, everyone here is. We're very grateful to have heard your voice today. I hope it won't be the last time we hear it. Same goes for you, Dana. <laughs> well, if isolation is invention, to quote a poet. <laughs> we have had an incredible, incredible container and opportunity for invention in these past months. And we've been hearing it week after week. And I am now so thrilled to invite the third star of our constellation today Paige Hill Starzinger, whose second poetry collection, Vortex Street, launched in June 2020 from Barrow Street Press. Her first, Vestigial, selected by Lynn Emanuel, won the Barrow Street Prize in 2013. Unshelter, chosen by Mary Jo Bang, won the Noemi Chapbook Contest in, 20, in 2009. Page's poems have appeared widely in American Poetry Review, Fence, and Volt, um, among many other places. I am so happy that Jamie invited you, Paige, to join us in our, our lovely chain of poetry today. So welcome and thank you for being the star that you are. 
Thank you so much, Sandy and Don, for this platform and community. And it's a thrill to be reading with Dana, whose work I didn't know until today. It's so great. And to read with Jamie, who I've known now for a little while. It's a pleasure. I'm going to start with a poem I haven't read before. It's from my book, Vortex Street. I'm going to read, it's a central poem. I'm going to read two short parts from it. The title is Specula, and that Specula is a medical instrument um, for examinations. Um, it actually dilates um, parts of your body. And it's also the Latin word for mirror. Specula. To the man saying it's completely shut down as he presses the sonogram over my ovary. It is still part of my body. It is alive. It is mine. I want to know, is it velvety if you hold it? Is it ghostly white? Is it fragrant? Does it hum? Magnificent glands, corrugated, grooved, and furrowed. This is where my children would have sprung if you could time lapse back. Aaliyah, meaning dice, as in aleatoric music. Mozart selected a precise sequence of notes based on throwing a handful. Beauties we are, we say, beautiful. Esther dial in our vaginas and wind swept fires in our veins. And here's Here's a section that's a little bit more in the, it's in the middle of the, this long poem. What of need when you want less, when you think you want less, when the self is less, you think? Look how my bones osteoporosis, my pelvis endometriosis, my ribs, Fractious. This is the house, my house, my only home. I own no other. I lease one car. This is the, my body. The beauty, yes, I abandoned to feed on more expensive tastes. A cage to decorate became a cage to pain. This structure, this cage, if I could build a cage instead, how do you disinherit yourself? Tectonic indeed. Normal faults create space when the ground cracks, but as one tectonic plate forces itself on another, this is a thrust fault. I am full of faults. Natural mistakes, they lie until uncovered. Fun fact, a fault under the Himalayan mountains pushes them up by a centimeter each year. Would my life coach think this was busy work? Thank you. In this next poem, um, when I when I refer to X, um, I'm referring to AIX as an X in Provence. Um, it's a small town in the south of France. My unborn child says to me, "You." are a mouse in a dove coat. An apron with hands, that's what I didn't want to be, I replied. It's taken you a long time to catch on. 
but is it a race? Time grew tired waiting. He's sexist, you're binary. I don't think I was strategic. No, you wanted to be free of the past, untethered, to step into a stream like your mother, walk one narrow slice of water after another, mayflies rising, a world constantly changing, shimmering. You felt this was New York. That sounds right. See, I knew you before you saw the stream. I lay inside you when you curled within your mother. I was one of your last two eggs. You saw me on the sonogram, remember? I look at my right thumbnail, misshapen from picking at cuticles. I can't see this child now, but for the voice. We come accidentally and try to find our place. I have been hungry before in the south of France, the Cyprus, the picnics, the boys' lips, simply too animal, unprotected we were, but everything else receded. A blaze of heat pushing outward, filling me. Probably a late period, so I went to his doctor and he recommended a wash just from the pharmacy, nothing much. Yes, I recall, X comes from Latin for water. You have never been ready. I was pursuing the boy. And then you didn't trust your body again. I think it scared me. You worry too much about the past. Stop dwelling there. Where did you get so bossy? I mean, definitive. I got it from you, dear. I'm going to read uh, one poem from uh, that has three parts from my first book, Vestigial, which, as Sandy noted, um, won the Barrow Street Prize. Um, Lynn Emanuel chose it. Um, the artists Saul Lewitt and Louise Nevelson are mentioned in this poem. There's a title and there's subtitles. Terroir. One, unshelter. I can't open the door. And even if I draw a doormat on the floor, I can't break out. Underneath, I see the sill, my slice of thin enough for a canter's turtle surfacing twice a day for one breath. I could whittle myself into fiction. Saul Lewitt's breakthrough wall drawings sketched from ceiling to floor like modern cave art are made to be painted over. What is left behind? Lewitt sketched diagrams, the turtle lays eggs, me, swallow nesting on a curtain, or set of box springs on an LA freeway shoulder. Man says, unshelter oneself. Don't limit oneself to words when there are sentences. Two, cast off. The hummingbird sings outside your office, little quick, chirps like a chipmunk. This delights you. Louise Nevelson in Don's Wedding Feast painted stacked wooden crates filled with street finds, shutters, hubs, chess pieces, all white, absolved. And you who see the jams, the argivolt, the panic bar, the peephole, 
you put your fingers on my right arm and say, I'll find you. Three, Outland. I'd like to spend a weekend not thinking about it. Don't tell me it's about befriending who we are already. I repainted my apartment throughout what was inside. What do you give up when you're a prisoner? You lie down in the dirt. Wise people, says a New York Times reporter, quoting C, a 67-year-old mother of seven, don't sit around and dwell. California spends in excess of 55 million on litter removal. Fresh Kills Landfill on Staten Island is one of two man-made structures you can see from space. The other, Great Wall of China. The Greeks got it right. They named the seahorse-shaped hippocampus where memories lie, sea monster. And I'm going to finish with, with two new poems uh, in the typewriter. <laughs> they are they just in, during, during the pandemic. As maple trunks thaw, I was pushed out of my mother's body one April cold and wet in the fifth season of the year, a measure of frost and mud. It was past the last sap boil, more amber than gold. I was a dial suspended in a chunk of glass like ice, my initials carved into it. Today, I click into a digital video conference, faces populate, time snags, and pixels sputter. So someone looks like a Francis Bacon portrait, enlarged head leaking over the chest. We share 35% of our DNA with daffodils, 98% with chimps. Our cars burn dinosaur bones and the oxygen we breathe is an excretion of ancient bacteria. Is it any wonder we romanticize a row of tall pines set against empty sky, the sunset, a family, different sizes and shapes, calling each other as a wind rumbles through them. A song like a cello might make before it was crafted into an instrument. Thank you. Um, then the last poem, yonder in her glimmering sphere. My mother said, I'm losing my mind. My father reported he had all his teeth. I wasn't sure whether to laugh or cry as they say, and that was before they misplaced their words entirely. Mother, tell me, are you in the bardo now? I hope you can talk again. Is there a good time tomorrow? Right now, the floor needs vacuuming. So many dust bunnies, so much of it me. 40,000 skin cells a minute, 100 hair strands a day. And my bone tissue, we are outlined in loss. But you'd be surprised how little of us there is. More microbes than our own cells. And how much of our body is water? Echo asked, who's there? As Narcissus leaned over 
his reflection. Fugitive die, I say to the pair of ghosts, as in loosen your grip, wash away. But my mother's not drawing up the anchor any time soon. Hi, sweets, she says. I'm here to advise. There is no view, no heat or cold, no present or future, nothing but the slow and sure movement. Oh, and by the way, do you have children? Silence. Vincent, she yells for my father, rowing between clouds on his single skull. Maybe we should adopt. No, he says firmly. Mother flicks a fly line into a galaxy of ultraviolet light ignited by hot white dwarfs and supernovas. Never be sorry, she says. Keep writing. I did not respond. Are you there? It was such a strange autumn. So much rain. The chlorophyll did not break down. The leaves held on green until they fell almost at once, vanishing into the blue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paige Hill Starzinger. I'm a little bit breathless after that final poem. You know, sometimes I like to really take a pause to drink it in. It's fantastic, fantastic new work. And of course, party can. Hardy, congratulations, Hardy, congratulations on Vortex Street from Barrow Street Press. Folks, how about we unmute for a moment and give our, the, this alchemy of poets that we've heard from today, Dana Patterson, Jamie McCarty and Paige Hill Starzinger. How about we unmute and give a rousing round? Thank you. Fantastic. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah, right. Yeah, Josephine. Thank from, you so much. Yeah. Patricia, hello. Hi, uh, yeah. Reminded me of what my mother was going through. It was yes. like very intense. I feel very wow. Yeah. Brought back memories. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's a difficult, it's difficult to see. It's very mind. hard. Yeah. You don't get over it, really. Well, friends, that was our 38th week of live amazing. poetry. Truly amazing. Absolutely. Amazing. You're amazing. 38 <laughs> weeks. Oh my God. Well, you are amazing. It can't happen without all of you out there. It really can't. You know, Don and I hold the space. And so oh, beautifully. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Don, really, this is remarkable. It's, it has a wonderful, warm feeling to it, your, your platform. And um, just thank you so much for bringing us all together. Yeah. And Dana, thank you for starting the chain. Starting the chain. Extraordinary reading. I'll just have a few closing remarks and then we will forge ahead with our December and our day here. Folks, you have been listening to, as I said, this, this extraordinary alchemy of these three just stunning poets that shared their work today from their new in our new book showcase so a reminder again Dana Patterson Jamie McCarty and Paige Hill Starzinger 
please, if you have the resources, support them, support their presses, support their editors, support poetry, um, and 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 uh, purchase one or all. Uh, I mean, a collection of today. You know, if you bought the collection from today, um, so please do that. Uh, and a reminder that next week is our last week of poetry for 2020. Jamie, I'm gonna break string at 39 consecutive and take a couple weeks off. I know, I need to. Yes, thank you. <laughs> 2020 has been a year, as you all know, that we'll be hard pressed to forget because of the pandemic. But again, as I, as I mentioned earlier, also because of the way it's amplified poetry and brought poets together. So again, I hope you'll join, you'll join me and others next week to get together uh, for some poetry, song and cheer and in between readings of a few special guests that we have lined up. You also can be part of the light. You can give thanks and gratitude by sharing a poem with us, one of your own original poems or the poem that speaks to you in this season of light. We'll have a sign up on Thursday, but it's really gonna function more like a poetry holiday open house. So please uh, join us next week if you can. And a reminder, as I said, uh, next week's our final reading will be off on the 29th and January 3rd, as I like to say, we'll be on holiday, but join us next January tw in 2021 for our first new book showcase on January 10th, where we will welcome back to the Poetry Zoom studio here, Mary Ellen Talley, Mervyn Taylor, Gigi Bella and Wayne Power, all reading from their new books. And looking ahead a little bit later into January on the 24th will be Shira Dents, Jennifer K. Sweeney and Jen Koretnik. Great, I mean, great. It just gets better and better and better. It's always fantastic. There's always magic when poets get together to share. That. And you're gonna be reading for me. I am gonna be reading for Mention you. Mention that, also. you're gonna be reading with, J, with, JP, uh, with JP, JP Howard, I can't and wait. And Susanna and H. Case. H. Case. So hey, yes. that's uh, January 20th. That's a great reading, January 20th. I know it's January, January 30th, oh, January 30th. Well, I got it's the last Saturday of the month. You, you, you'll be yes. getting the invites. Roxanne is going to take care of it. And that's the Brownstone Poet Series in Brooklyn. Yay. Not like I said the Bronx last time. Oh, yeah, you remember that. Remember that? Remember I that? did originally come from the Bronx. So I know I did. Queens. <laughs> yes. Well, everybody. Yes, I'll be reading on January 30th. So I have something to look forward to. Oh, JP Howard and Susanna Case. That's like my dream reading to go to, let alone I get to read in it. Thank you, Patricia. So uh, invite oh. your friends, invite the family there, promote your books. You know, we, we put up links. Yeah, you do a great job. You do a great yeah, it's, 